Washington and in our country, it can be rather disheartening. We are inundated with headlines about the failing economy, unemployment, violence, and tragedy. Our very constitution is under attack, and the foundation of our country is being challenged like never before. I don't know about you, but I often sit and read the headlines and wonder, how did we get here? C.S. Lewis once said, we all want progress, but progress means getting near to the place you want to be. And if you have taken a wrong turning, then to go forward does not get you any nearer. If you are on the wrong road, progress means doing an about turn and walking back to the right road. And in that case, the man who turns back the soonest is the most progressive man. We believe that it is time for this country and for our schools to do what Lewis talked about and do an about turn and walk back to the right road. And that is exactly what we're doing. of young people will rise up and do great things where others have failed or gone astray. But in order to expect our children to do great things, we have to equip them with the proper tools. It doesn't happen by accident. We have to be deliberate and purposeful. Psalm 78 says that we do our children a disservice if we don't teach the lessons learned by generations past. The psalmist writes, I will utter hidden things, things from of old, things our ancestors have told us. We will not hide them from our descendants. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of our Lord, which he commanded our ancestors to teach our children, so the next generation would know them, even the children yet to be born, and they in turn would tell their children. If we want our children to do the kinds of things that were done by the greatest generation, then we need to give them the kind of education that the greatest generation had. If we want them to exhibit courage, integrity, self-control, and to learn the value of hard work and sacrifice, then we need to teach them to read the great books where heroes do heroic things, evil is vanquished, and good prevails. If we want them to be unafraid to stand firm in the face of their peers, then we need to ground them in their faith. If we want them to be the clear voice of reason in the chaos of this world, we need to help them find their voice so they can declare with confidence what is true and what is right. We pursue education because we want to be more like Christ. We pursue character because we need to be people of integrity to do the right thing in the times ahead. We pursue truth because we need to have an answer for relativism. We pursue wisdom because we need an effective weapon against our own ignorance. At Oakdale Academy, we're doing just that, educating a new kind of leader for the next generation. We're doing this in the classroom every day with our students, which you'll see demonstrated in just a few minutes. But first, it gives me great pleasure to announce some very exciting news this evening, and I am privileged to be able to share this news with you. Oakdale Academy has been chosen as one of three schools in the country, and the only school in Michigan other than Hillsdale Academy, to assist Hillsdale College in training and apprenticing college students to become teachers in classical schools all over this country. for America, 
as Oakdale Academy is making real substantive change in the lives of our children and leading the way to a desperately needed revolution in education. And now, I would love to introduce to you three Oakdale Academy students who are here with us this evening. They have agreed to give you a small snapshot of what we do at Oakdale. Every morning, we begin our day with opening ceremony. We say the Pledge of Allegiance, we sing the National Anthem, and we join together in prayer. And then, one student recites something from memory in front of the entire student body and teachers. Each student does recitation twice a year, from the youngest to the oldest, once in the fall and once in the spring. So at this time, I would like to invite Ms. McKinley Brown, Mr. Richard Tuttle, and Mr. Luke Benninger up to join me here on the stage. Theodore Roosevelt was our 26th president, and 
he served from 1901 to 1909. He later led the Bull Moose Party, a progressive political group that supported the giving of women the right to vote, congressional transparency, and camp campaign finance reform. He gave this speech, Duty and Self-Control, to the University of Wisconsin at Madison on April 15, 1911, just before the onset of World War I. When you take power, you also assume responsibility. No man can get power without at the same time acquiring the duty of being held to a rigid accountability for his use of that power. I wish to see the people in absolute control, but when you, the people, assume that control, remember that you cannot shirk the responsibility that comes with it. The sovereign in any country and in any land must be held accountable for the way in which he uses the vast power that is his, and in our case, the sovereign is the people. The idea each of us must have, first and foremost, all of you individually and separately, and you collectively in company with us as fellow laborers, is duty. That is the important word for us, because the thought it symbolizes is the important thought for us to have ever in our hearts, in our minds. The man who is in danger of oppression from the sovereign can afford to think of his rights, first and foremost. But the man who is really sovereign, or the entity which is really sovereign, must think of its duties first. When Abraham Lincoln was the head of our people, he thought of what? Of his rights? No. He thought of his duties. If he had been thinking of his rights, we would not today be appealing to his memory. We appeal to his memory because he served duty, because he thought always of his duty to his fellow man. He was a great man, but the people should be greater than any one man, and the people cannot be greater unless the people think of duty more than of right, just as the individual man who rises has to think first of his duty and then of his rights. They must think of duty, they must think of rights as developed in duty rather than of only their individual rights. Unless the people, unless the sovereign, develop that capacity to think each one of what is due from him to his fellows and not of what is due from his fellows to him. Unless they develop that capacity, this country, based as it is on popular government, cannot achieve the place that it must and will achieve. I appeal to the memory of men who fought in the Civil War, the soldiers who followed Grant and Sherman, when you went into battle, you were not thinking of your rights. You were thinking of your duties. Of your duty to the flag. Your duty to the country. Your duty to the men and women you had left behind who would rather that you gave that duty, even at the cost of life, than that you shirked your duty and saved your life. That is what you thought of. And if you had not thought of that, you would not have been worth your salt as soldiers. If you had not put duty first and foremost, we would not today have had a great united country. The slaves would not now be free. We have not only really attained, and in certain communities have really attained, genuine popular rule, genuine self-government. Now, think what this word means, self-government. It does not mean the absence of government. There must be government, or we will have purely anarchy, pure destruction. It means literally self-government. It means there must be just as much government as before, only that it should be applied by everyone. We teach a boy that government means to control himself, and he's able to escape the need of parental control just so far as he develops that power of self-control. There are some boys you can trust, and who are able to shift for themselves just because they're able to control themselves. So it is with our citizenship. Now and then we hear the appeal to give such and such a nation self-government. I have had some worthy friends in Boston appeal to me to give self-government to a number of individuals who regard themselves overdressed when they wear breech clouds. 
You cannot give self-government to anybody. He has got to earn it for himself. You can give him the chance to obtain self-government, but he himself, at his own heart, must do the governing. He must govern himself. That is what it means. That is what self-government means. And now, as our people assume control more and more of the machinery of government, as their part in the government occasionally or rapidly becomes more direct, as their representatives become more intelligent, it behooves them to remember that only the exceptional people have ever succeeded in the experiment of self-government. Because its needs, its interests, and its successful working imply the existence within the heart of the average citizen of certain very high qualities. There must be control. There must be mastery somewhere. And if there is no self-control and self-mastery, the control and the mastery will ultimately be imposed from without.